Hello everyone, thank you for watching. These are all the atmospheric river events that we observed over the water year across the west region over the last maybe six months or so, a little bit longer. This came out, this is from the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes out of the UC San Diego. And it's a great way, I think, to summarize all the rain, snow events, the inclement weather that we've had over the water year. When we kind of went into this water year, we were, I think in a way, rooting for some of these to build up the snowpack, to increase the rainfall, certainly for areas uh, you know, like California, Nevada, Arizona, that have seen some drought issues over the last decade. And we can kind of you know, think at least ahead that we will see drought again, of course, not necessarily a forecast, but just given how we get our weather in the West, kind of either all at once and then not for a while and then all at once, et cetera, it's important to build up, you know, those reservoirs in the snowpack like we've seen over this water year. And I think if you just glance at it, right, the first thing you kind of see is that there's a lot of focus on the Pacific Northwest. A lot of these atmospheric river events focused there over the past six months. Now, that isn't uncommon. If you've lived in the Pacific Northwest, you've visited there, the Cascades, Northwest or Western Washington, you know, one of the first things I think that any of us would think is, man, it rains a lot here. And then if you're at high enough elevation in the Cascades or skiing or the uh, Cascade volcanoes, there's a lot of snow in the upper elevations uh, as well. So seeing a lot of focus there in terms of the atmospheric river events over the winter is normal. But as you get further south, you can see that California had its share of atmospheric river events this year. If we were to compare it to 2023, maybe not quite as many strong events, but still enough over the past kind of three to four months, at least since we turned the page to 2024, that we've had a pretty good water year here when all is said and done in this El Nino winter, this El Nino water year that we just had. So kind of other, you know, whatever you want, peculiarities you want to call about, uh, you know, some of the orientation of these atmospheric river events, that kind of the angle of attack, if you will, these arrows matters. Now these atmospheric river events, this kind of makes them look static. They aren't these kind of static stuck arrows right on the map as they come through often you know taking some of these as example february 4th this was the kind of santa barbara los angeles rain event sure it started at this angle of attack here uh, north maybe the santa maria oxnard area and then slowly shifted further south in due time over la santa barbara area so these don't kind of paint the whole picture but at least in terms of a quick snapshot of a whole water year i think it's a, a really neat presentation they're color coded by the uh, magnitude of those atmospheric rivers. So the red ones are strong and these pink ones are extreme. If you look closely, kind of curiously, some of these uh, other weaker events are still notable, I think, for California. And again, it's because of that that angle of attack that matters, especially when you consider the topography of the western U.S. What I mean by that, consider the Sierra Nevadas, which run not quite totally north to south, but certainly north-northwest to south, uh, southeast, kind of in that orientation there. You can see the uh, elevation that big blizzard that we had right at the beginning of March, we talked about the ridiculous snow amounts, 10 feet of snow or areas of excess to that, uh, you know, wind observations well, well over 100 miles an hour. You know, when you first look at this, you're probably thinking, you know, where's the big pink or red arrow pointed right at, you know, the Lake Tahoe area, the central Sierra Nevadas. Curiously enough, it's actually this blue. It was actually technically a weak atmospheric river. But what's not captured here is that angle which matters that coming in kind of if you look maybe that one compared to other ones is more zonal and what i mean by that it's more oriented west to east and i think when i do these videos that gets reversed so this might be west to east we'll see on the playback if that's right maybe west to east uh, we'll figure that one out but this march 2nd one is the one that was pointed right at the nevadas and delivered all that snowfall that helped us get us right above average right at the beginning of march just need to see if you remember back from the end of January there's the San Diego flooding um, there are videos of, of cars going out to see water rescues on the San Diego River that's this January 2nd or 22nd one I should say coming in and you'll notice that's a very different angle or orientation than a lot of these other kind of southwest to northeast oriented atmospheric river events so there's a lot going on here it's not just you know this one was weaker this one was strong it's how they impact it's what the moisture profile looks like what the mountains are uh, how those are oriented uh, that all matter here but when all sudden done a pretty busy year and uh, a lot of folks with more water now than we had certainly going in uh, to the year at the end of last year this is a whole pdf report uh, i invite you to look at maybe i can get this uh the link in the description here at the uh end of the recording um, if you look closely here, I do like how they kind of segmented this out. This is um, the early half of the water year up here on the top left of the screen. You can see a lot of the focus on the uh, Pacific Northwest. But as we went January through March, we had far more events oriented and coming towards Central and Southern California. And that's that kind of late surge that really caught us back up to average and then above average for the water year for different uh, measurements and snowpack, specifically for the state of California here. If I'm jumping us up us to uh, present day here across the Western region, 
looking across the eastern Pacific and then the western maybe third of the United States here, it's really pretty quiet, not too much to talk about. I think the last two videos I remarked that off the uh, Washington and Oregon coast, there was a spinning low pressure system. I think just kind of curiously or coincidentally, the last two videos, that was the case. And we were talking about the weather that would impact over the next 48 or 72 hours as a result of that. Not seeing that here, not really anything immediately off the coast. If you look, okay, if we look really closely, there is a bit of, you can kind of see that curvature in these low level clouds. And what I mean by that is it almost looks like there might be some cyclonic or counterclockwise flow here, just off screen here to the north. Keep that in mind, that's gonna be relevant for the weekend forecast because there is a low pressure system hiding up here uh, just off screen, but at least for the immediate kind of 28, uh, 24 to 48 hours, not too much to talk about here across the Western region, really not terribly too many clouds, um, despite some fair weather cumulus here across Northwest Montana and some high wispy cirrus now over the Western region. A little bit warmer today as well. That's a nice change of pace from where uh, we've talked about with a lot of these videos, we had cold weather come through over this Packers weekend. We were a little bit concerned about frost and freeze in the Central Valley. Looking at some of the observations there, it looked like areas in the San Joaquin Valley, Delano, some of the more low-lying areas did get very close, about 33 degrees Fahrenheit, but not quite down to that uh, exact freezing level. Jump over and take a look at uh, temperatures here. These are valid just here, uh, kind of around lunchtime across the western region, back into the 70s, even high 70s in the San Joaquin Valley, Southern California. A little bit cooler, but still a nice day along the coastal areas. Mid to high 80s here across the lower Colorado River Valley and 80s further east into Arizona. And you can see more seasonable temperatures up in Montana, eastern Washington, parts of Oregon, Idaho. Not this big kind of shot of cold air that we've been looking at, you know, over the past two or three weeks. But unfortunately, as we get into the forecast, we still have some lingering cold weather to deal with. Not any indications right now of a major frost, but there is a little bit of risk there. Uh, we'll talk about that, break that down in just a few slides here. Jump over and look at the National Weather Service. These are all the hazards, uh, watches, warnings, advisories active here across the Western region as of, again, just about uh, just after lunchtime here on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, but looking across this, really not much to talk about. Uh, flood warning here across southwestern Utah, maybe some wind advisories further east across the divide. Otherwise, pretty quiet, consistent with the satellite picture that we just looked at a few slides ago with not much to write home about. I want to jump over, these are the uh, 500 millibar anomalies from the ECMWF forecast. Now it's not a forecast yet, I'll make it current here for lunchtime across the west uh, Pacific time. If you look closely here, this is uh, an upper level ridge, that's what those warmer temperatures uh, or warmer anomalies I should say highlight here. Now these upper level ridges, we've talked about this, these tend to bring in warmer conditions, drier conditions, calmer weather, less to talk about in videos like this, and that's the, uh, the case here certainly across the western U.S. with warmer calmer temperatures, rather a nice week setting up here uh, for the western region, despite some uh, colder temperatures here, maybe over into Montana and then east of the divide, which are less under the influence of that ridge, at least here on Wednesday uh, afternoon. Now, we mentioned this just a few slides ago. If you look to the top of the image, there's that trough in the associated low pressure system near the surface that I'm worried about in terms of the weekend uh, forecast here. So this is, uh, we'll call this the ridge here, but there's this trough here just uh, kind of in the Gulf of Alaska, so south of that Alaska coastline, west of British Columbia. And this is uh, unfortunately gonna be making its way into uh, our territory here as we go through the next few days. So we'll step through that in the forecast here. This is through Thursday midday, and then into Thursday evening, ultimately now taking the forecast out to Friday morning. Now this is something of a, kind of a compact trough, not the biggest system that we've seen this year. Certainly they get a little bit weaker this time of year. But as I take this forecast into Friday evening and then Saturday morning, you can see it positioned essentially just off the coast of San Francisco. You can imagine flow coming around it like this, likely a low pressure system embedded underneath this trough. If ridges bring in right this warm, calm, dry, not much to talk about weather, a great day for getting outside these troughs, these low pressure systems, right, bring in uh, cooler weather, uh, all else equal. Uh, tend to be more clouds associated with them, rain, snowfall in the upper elevations, uh, and all those things are on deck for the forecast uh, for California as we get into Saturday as a result of uh, this forecast here. Again, kind of a compact closed system. Um, looks, you know, rather potent, at least on this, uh, the anomaly map here, the temperatures, um, but don't think it's going to be the biggest event, certainly not compared to what we've seen uh, earlier in the water year. Um, that'll weaken as it moves through over the weekend before exiting east. There is another trough trying to dive in 
out of Western Canada as we go into the early week next week. That's probably gonna keep temperatures suppressed at least early in the week in some of the northern states, but transitioning through some of the southern states as well uh, around midweek. Now, I think we talked about this last week that these troughs that are coming more so out of uh, the north, out of Canada, versus you know coming out of the Pacific tend to have less rainfall and snowfall associated with them despite being a little bit colder. So not expecting a big precipitation event out of this uh, early week trough next week, um, but it is unfortunately probably gonna keep temperatures down and preventing it from being kind of a nice transition into the early week. The only good news I have, uh, you know, if I take this forecast into uh, the end of next week is that ridging, that was kind of consistent with what we just started the video with. It's trying to reestablish itself over the Western US as we get near the end of the next work week. This forecast valid for Friday evening, uh, April 19th. So perhaps near the end of the next work week, temperatures improving, conditions improving, getting some of the cold weather uh, out of here so we can enjoy you know spring in April and May that is coming up here. Uh, we'll have to take a look at that in a few slides here. Wanted to get a broader view of the satellite imagery. This is just kind of a uh, bigger blown up view of what we were looking at earlier. So here's the Eastern Pacific. You can see Alaska way up here. And there's that upper level trough that we just looked at on that forecast. Well, here it is in real life, looking down at the satellite across the uh, North America and the Eastern Pacific, the uh, low pressure system associated with that embedded up here in the Gulf of Alaska. This is what's gonna be diving down and influencing the weather in California and some other states as we go through the weekend here. Jump over and look at the ECMW forecast. This is for precipitation type and intensity. Try to get us some uh, sense of when is this gonna be coming through? How strong is this precipitation gonna be? As we go through the day tomorrow into Thursday, again, pretty clear across the Western region. You have to go way up into the Northwest reaches of the US to find some precipitation associated with that on Thursday afternoon. So take that through Thursday evening into Friday, we start to see that low pressure system off the coast of California coming more into view there. If I take this into uh, Saturday morning, now we have rainfall falling across the Bay Area into parts of the Sacramento Valley, coastal California, perhaps through the south central coastline on Saturday morning, deep overnight Friday into Saturday morning, and ultimately increasing in coverage, at least in terms of the central valley during the day on Saturday, perhaps getting down as far south as Southern California, maybe even San Diego, seeing some showers out of this as we go through the day Saturday and lingering into the overnight Saturday with some snow showers uh, expected in the Sierra Nevadas. Not a major blizzard event. This isn't one of these big atmospheric river events that we're gonna add to the graphic on the page before, but enough perhaps to uh, add a few snowfall totals here to the water year total when all said and done. And then through the day on Sunday, just some lingering showers across parts of uh, California here, probably nothing too significant, maybe Eastern Oregon, parts of Western Idaho as well, before clearing out of the air on Monday and then into Monday afternoon. If you remember, that's when we talked about that next trough, right, diving down from Canada. And you can see the influence of that with some light snow showers here at elevation, some light rain showers. Again, not expecting a ton of precipitation out of that Canada originated trough that's going to be moving through. This is going to be kind of a quick hitter with some snow perhaps in northwest Montana, eastern Oregon, just some light amounts, parts of central Montana along that cold front as it moves through before that establishes itself over the area through the next work week, bringing temperatures down through the midweek time period next week perhaps near the end of that, warming up those temperatures first along the westernmost regions before perhaps getting into maybe the early indications of what could be a nicer weekend next weekend. Unfortunately, this one uh, that we're coming up to, uh, a bit more inclement weather to talk about. Jump over and look at the National Weather Service forecast for temperature anomalies. This will just give us an idea which days are gonna be warmer than average, which are gonna be cooler than average. We can talk about that temperature shift. Um, this is for Wednesday. We just looked at those warmer conditions spreading over the region. That's pretty consistent with what we just saw on satellite. A lot of sunshine, just those high wispy cirrus clouds, a rather nice day. Going through Thursday, looking even better, warmer temperatures across eastern Oregon, Willamette Valley, seasonal, northwest Montana warming up uh, in a big way, I think, tomorrow. Central Valley, Southern California, Arizona, et cetera, looking at a nice day Thursday. Again, you have to get to the very far northwest, maybe just getting into the SeaTac area until we still have the influence of that uh, trough coming in tomorrow on Thursday. As we get into Friday, remember that's when that low pressure system in the trough started to materialize more off the coast of California, bringing temperatures down, clouds, maybe some rain starting on Friday, uh, April 12th. Before Saturday, when all that rain and some of that snow is overspreading the Sierra Nevadas, temperatures dropping further along coastal California, the Central Valley. But that low pressure system, at least out ahead of it, is going to be trying to push up some warmth into these areas that aren't under the influence of the clouds. So some of the other areas across the West still enjoying the warmer temperatures on Saturday this weekend. Sunday, colder temperatures abounding across California, parts of Nevada, now getting into Arizona and Utah. 
as well again as this trough weakens and shifts over the area on sunday and then into monday shifting further toward the east now monday and tuesday if you're watching closely again that's when that trough coming out of canada is going to be moving through that's going to bring temperatures down here during the midweek time period i am kind of looking out into the future if this kind of keeps swinging through could expose the central valley to some additional frost risk kind of mid to late week uh, next week Look at those overnight low temperatures. Again, this is the National Weather Service forecast for those 24-hour overnight low temperatures to give us an idea of where the frost and freeze risk might remain for California and Southern Arizona. The low pressure system that's coming through over the next kind of 48, 72 hours into Friday and then into Saturday. It's too compact. It doesn't have a lot of uh, colder air that it's bringing down with it out of Canada because of its origin more over the Pacific and just how cut off it is from that broader jet stream level flow. So just kind of that look, not concerned about a frost uh, or freeze associated with that event. It will bring those temperatures down like we looked at. But if you look at the San Joaquin overnight lows into the maybe the mid 40s, not a concern for frost, talking mid to high 40s in the Sacramento Valley as well. It's really the second trough that's coming through. You can see these temperatures getting lower now across the northern states, um, getting toward freezing territory in northwest uh, Montana, getting into the mid-30s in the Willamette Valley, mid-30s in the Snake River Valley. Still in the mid-40s or upper 40s here on Tuesday morning. But if I shift over and look at the ECMWF forecast, I'll make this valid as of uh, Tuesday night or Tuesday morning, I should say. You can see those temperatures dropping near 40 or upper 30s in the Sacramento Valley. So we go into Wednesday morning, again near 40, um, just a little bit close for comfort, and then into uh, Friday morning dropping down to 40, maybe even uh, high 30s here. This is right a five, six, seven, eight day forecast getting out ahead. There's time for this trough maybe to get a little bit more potent. Um, you know, it could weaken or it's not bringing as colder temperatures, but it could be on the other side where it is a bit colder than what we're expecting. It's something to keep an eye on, certainly going out into next week. Not expecting a frost or freeze of this, but certainly can't rule it out considering that kind of colder look uh, coming into the week, uh, the work week next week. If we look at the zero to seven, this is a seven day temperature anomaly map from the ECMWF. Uh, if I take this out, really kind of valid as of uh, tomorrow and then out into the next work week, you can see the story here that we're cooling off California, parts of Nevada, Arizona and Oregon um, really over the next seven days with these systems coming through. That's consistent with those forecasts that we just looked at. We get the precipitation uh, totals. This takes us through Monday midday. So starting here, going through Monday midday. Um, can see not a huge kind of precipitation maker as this low pressure system comes through. Uh, a good amount of coastal rainfall here along the central and southern coasts, uh, but not talking you know major flooding concerns here, maybe near an inch of rainfall or a little bit less. I think Southern California has um, kind of a lower floor on it. Um, could not be talking about much uh, significant precipitation. If this trends up, you might be talking about half an inch uh, around the Central Valley. Um, could be looking at anywhere from a quarter of an inch underneath some of the more potent showers. Could boost that up toward maybe half an inch, maybe a little bit more in some kind of select or local municipalities. But otherwise, just kind of across the board, not seeing a ton of precipitation uh, out of this one. And that holds true if we look at that snowfall forecast, which I'll take out. I'll make that valid as of, uh, let's go Tuesday at lunchtime. Talk about the Sierra Nevadas getting those snow showers, uh, but this is not, you know, one of these big atmospheric uh, river events or blizzards that we've seen this year. We're talking only four, maybe to eight inches of uh, snowfall, maybe pushing up near 10 inches uh, in some of these upper level uh, elevations here, but not, not much to write home about, not anything that's going to add a significant amount to the snowpack across the western region as a result of uh, the two systems coming in. If I take it out a little bit further, you can see here along the front range of the Rockies some more snowfall as that trough dives in from Canada. But again, we've talked about that when those troughs come out of the north, not the Pacific, they don't have quite as much moisture associated with them, and that reduces the rainfall and the snowfall totals uh, and the potential that we can get out of them. Now, since we last spoke on uh, Wednesday, the monthly updates to the seasonal forecast from the ECMWF model came out. These forecasts well in advance, really kind of getting through um, the rest of summer here. Um, of course, this kind of long range seasonal forecast gets very much, uh, you know, remind people an inexact science. These don't have a ton of skill associated with them, um, but often, you know, they give us some sense of where things are trending. We can at least take the forecast that uh, we can see from the ECMWF, compare them to what we're seeing with the Right, maybe out in the Pacific looking at El Nino or La Nina, we're seeing where things are going there, see if they disagree or if they're consistent with what we're seeing there. And uh, there's been a little bit of uh, an interesting shift here. Uh, I'll show you in just a few slides here. Uh, first, I want to show you this. This is the precipitation anomaly forecast from that ECMWF seasonal model for summer. So what we're seeing here is these uh, kind of brown and beige colors. That's where we're expecting less precipitation than normal. 
And we see that green, as you might have guessed, is we're expecting more precipitation than normal for the summer months, June, July, August of 2024 here. Now, kind of two things to note that I think are relevant uh, for the Western region here. Um, one, not seeing as strong of a uh, monsoon signal, at least early in the monsoon season for folks in Arizona and New Mexico, maybe even Nevada and far southeastern California. That's one signal here, so potential drought across the southwest. But we've also seen this kind of, kind of consistent drought signal here across parts of the central or high plains, extending up through the Rockies in the front range. And then the potential concern here is there is an area here, we've talked about this, that has a lack of snowpack here, at least compared to normal here at the early part of April. And the more drought we put on top of that in summer, the more heat that we build in here could only exacerbate those issues. So still a little bit, bit concerned here about the northern states with elevation and a lack of snowpack here. This is a consistent signal that we've seen this year of drought potential developing out of the southwest or Four Corners region and expanding up into parts of uh, Montana, Wyoming, and potentially eastern Idaho uh, as well. So keeping an eye on this signal here and that monsoon connection as well. If I take the forecast further out into the monsoon season, July, August, September, August, September, October, again, seeing that kind of signal linger, suggesting perhaps a weaker monsoon season this year. Jump over and look at the temperatures from that same time period. I'll make this valid again, June, July, August. This makes a lot of sense where we see that drought development. We typically see more heat build in. There are feedback effects. So the more that drought gets entrenched, it dries out the soil, that dries out the plants. The plants help to kind of keep things cooler, especially if they can retain some of that moisture. So as you take water out of the cycle, you also increase the chances for heating up the soil, heating up the ground, there's less shade, um, and that makes the heat kind of overlap areas where we see drought build in. So it's not a coincidence that the same area I highlighted uh, for warmer temperatures um, or warmer uh, or higher drought risk have this warmer temperature signal as well from the ECMWF seasonal forecast. If we do look further west, however, if you look closer to California, parts of western Oregon, Washington, not seeing quite as graduated of that heat signal here over the summer. Um, I think this would be good news just based on, you know, we talked about having more snowpack, more water in the reservoirs, be able to hang on to more of that for future use cases, less evaporative demand, et cetera. So um, we'll see how this forecast shakes out. If there's a lot of heat uh, in this area, it lessens the chance that you're gonna build in a lot of heat further west. So uh, we'll see how consistent this forecast is in the summer. Again, this isn't uh, you know a slam dunk home run forecast. There's not really um, anything like that and seasonal forecasting out this far, certainly not into the two to three month range, but it is a signal that we're seeing consistently from the models. It does make sense with a few of the developments we're seeing in the Pacific as well. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and it's enough that I wanted to share with you all to see how things develop as we go through the summer months here. Also, what came out with these seasonal forecasts from the ECMWF, uh, which I'll show you in just a sec, there it is loading here, is the latest uh, forecast for ENSO, that is uh, El Nino versus La Nina going forward through 2024. Now, if you look at this uh, forecast closely, higher up on this graph is uh, El Nino, and that's what we've been in over the last few months. That's this dotted line here, the observed temperature anomalies in the Pacific Ocean. These have been well above normal, and that is uh, an El Nino. So when you're up here, you're in an El Nino. When you dive well down here, you're into a La Nina, um, right? We look over this, we obsess about it, we try to figure out where it's going to forecast seasonally out, and especially for the Western region where the correlations are higher in terms of how these can impact our water year. Certainly just coming out of an El Nino winter, we expected more rain and snow for California and then received that. We wanna know what that forecast is gonna be like for next winter to apply that same kind of forecast confidence to what we're expecting right in 24 and then the 25 water year. It feels crazy saying 2025 already, but that's where we're at. So uh, this forecast here, at first glance, it's consistent with what we've seen. We're expecting a weakening of El Nino. That's very common as we go through the summer months. That weakening is expected to continue from the ECMWF and all the various model runs here. However, if we look closely at this, we're not seeing as strong of an La Nina signal. And what I mean by that is this is the forecast here that just came out uh, in early April here. I'm going to show you the one that came out in March, so about 30, 35 days ago. When I do that, if you look closely, more of the members here are near La Nina status from that March forecast than the now new updated one in April. So keep an eye on how many members here. you just kind of at a glance here looks at like at least 80%, maybe even 90% of the members have negative temperature anomalies in the Pacific, something of a developing La Nina as we go through the end of summer into early fall. I'm going to jump and update this forecast with the latest one from April. You can see that number shifting now at a glance, maybe 70, 75% of these members, but now there's 25% that actually stay above this zero degree, the average line here. So something of uh, not an El Nino continuing, but a neutral 
state in the Pacific continuing uh, through the summer. That's 25%, you know, it's not negligible. Now, more of these members, let's kind of reset, more of them are still calling for negative anomalies here, but less of them in the La Nina state, at least as we go through summer into early fall. These forecasts, just like we talked about, they're not perfect. The final La Nina or El Nino kind of development could be near the edge of this, and I'm drawing the line, you know, right the same color as all those plumes. Let me change that. Pink is not going to be a bunch better. Let's just, what's the opposite of uh, red? Here we go, light blue. So, you know, the final one could end up like that. It could end up on the lower range, something closer to La Nina going into next water year. But this definitely muddies the conversation, adds more uncertainty to the likelihood, I think, that we're in a La Nina uh, at the end of the year. That is still, right now, what a lot of the forecasts are suggesting, higher chance of being in La Nina as we go into next water year versus neutral or versus El Nino. I think based on this update here from the ECMWF, it's a reminder that that could not happen. Some of those forecasts are as high as maybe 80 to 85%. I've talked a little bit earlier why I think that number is a little bit lower, maybe something like 60 to 70% that, but that still puts it more likely than not, right? Um, but this is some uncertainty. There's some, um, we have to get through some more months here, look at some more observations out of the Pacific before we get um, confidence in whether we'll be in a La Nina or an El Nino. I think if you're rooting against a La Nina, this forecast update uh, is good news. Um, but there's more data to see as we go through May, June, and then the summer months. And of course, we have to look at drought over the summer months as well, look at where the monsoon's going, and tackle a lot of things before we get uh, to the next water year. One kind of fun thing is you can actually, we're looking at the plumes of just those, the chart of the ocean temperatures, you know, boil down to one line, but we can actually look at what the model is resolving in those sea surface temperatures across the Pacific to see where that La Nina may or may not be developing. And these are looking at uh, forecast monthly sea surface temperatures. This is valid, this first uh, map here, and I'll make this a little bit bigger so you can see it on the screen. This one's valid here as of uh, April. We're still in an El Nino. We talked about that in the last video, and this is where we measure uh, El Nino, one of the main regions for it right here. And you can see those waters are warmer than normal. That's El Nino, we, we've just talked about that. So if we're gonna be in a La Nina, those waters need to not only cool to neutral or, or white, maybe on this graphic, but need to get into those blue ranges rather significantly until we're in a uh, La Nina. So I'll make this forecast We'll just take it out into the future and see what the ECMWF, this latest seasonal one, does with those ocean temperatures into May, June, July, August, and now September, and then ultimately all the way out to October of 2024. Now, all the while I was, I was advancing those slides, the temperatures were cooling off, right, in that central tropical Pacific, but not aggressively. They kind of cooled off, certainly out of an El Nino, which is the expectation, but they weren't diving down into some of these colder ocean temperature anomalies that we see in a big strong La Nina. In fact, um, we kind of struggled to get some of these cold temperature anomalies west into the central Pacific uh, a few times. Now I'm going to take this uh, this forecast here and show you that March forecast run again from about 35 days ago. When I do that, look at how much stronger the La Nina was just comparing the two forecasts. So this latest forecast that has just come out here in early April shows a weaker La Nina signal into fall of this year. I would think you could extend that to say at least that forecast update is uh, shifting toward less likely of a La Nina, but we're talking maybe going from 70% to 60%. We're not talking, um, you know, going from 70 or 80% all the way down to 30 or 40%. Now it could trend further uh, in that direction. And then just like we saw the shift, it could shift back uh, in May or June to showing something of a stronger La Nina. Those are possibilities. If this sounds like a non-answer, I might even agree with you, but these are the signals we have uh, at the time, uh, and they're what I'll, uh, I'm happy to share with you, and we can figure it all out together. I think that takes us uh, to my last slide here. Thank you uh, for listening uh, on this Wednesday, and uh, I'll talk to you all next week. Thank you.